president's conversations, tapes that would include conversations between the president and John Dean. And NBC News today confirmed a report that those tapes have not been lying idle. John Osborne, our respected White House correspondent, reports in the next issue of the New Republic magazine that the tapes were used by White House staff members who helped draw up President Nixon's statement of May 22nd. That was the lengthy statement in which the president denied any knowledge of the Watergate break-in or cover-up. Osborne reports that the evidence on the tapes is mixed and confusing. Some of it is said to support the president. Other passages, though, could be interpreted as contradicting the president's position. And today, our correspondent Paul Duke also learned that the tapes have been used by the White House. According to White House sources, the tapes have been used more than once. As one example, reportedly in the reconstruction of logs recounting President Nixon's conversations with dismissed White House attorney John Dean. The tapes helped to clarify recollections which differed considerably from those of Dean, who has accused the president of taking part in the Watergate cover-up. The reports add an important new element to the controversy. Some members of the Senate committee say if the tapes are being used in the president's defense, then they should be used in the committee's investigation. The Republican vice chairman, Howard Baker, says it's now essential that key parts of the tape be turned over to the panel. And if it's made to appear that the White House has utilized these tapes, which were disclosed by Mr. Butterfield for the first time, if the White House, in fact, is using these tapes in effect for the preparation of their presentation through counsel or through witnesses to the committee, then the practical consideration ought to indicate that we have an opportunity to hear relevant portions of that tape and not just those sections that may have been used in the preparation of the White House position. I think I ought to say here that um, if I sound like I'm measuring my words, I am. I've previously indicated that I'm still hopeful that we can negotiate access to these tapes, that we won't founder on the rocks and shoals of executive privilege or the doctrine, the rather esoteric doctrine of separation of powers, but that we can find a way, a mutually helpful way, a beneficial way, to have access to that limited portion of these tapes that we want. Now, I still have that hope. But all the signs are the president will turn down the committee's request, putting the tapes in the category of confidential White House material. Thus, the breach between the president and the committee seems certain to widen. Paul Duke, NBC News, Washington. Officially, the White House this evening denied that the secret tapes have been used to help repair the president's position. And the White House today also announced that the secret recording of presidential conversations has been stopped. The reason it said is that people might not talk freely if they knew that their conversations were being recorded. There is other news today. In the Middle East, a Japanese jumbo jet and its passengers are st still being held by Arab terrorists. We'll have that story along with the plight of some American families living in West Germany. Those are families of U.S. soldiers who have to come home to the United States because they can no longer afford to live in Germany. And we'll also look at the Kung Fu films, the newest in thing in far out movies. I'm Bud Wilkinson with a message for Exxon customers. If you're wondering what's causing the current gasoline situation, Take a look down there, and you'll see one of the reasons for the problem. Our country is simply demanding more and more gasoline. Exxon wants you to know they're doing their best to provide more gasoline for you. Exxon's refineries are operating at record levels. They produced considerably more gasoline in the first six months of this year than they did in the first half of 1972. If everyone would drive more efficiently and cut back on just a small amount of gasoline each week, it would be a big help. Getting in tune-up, driving slower, and making sure your tires are properly inflated can save both gasoline and money. If you multiply any gasoline savings by the 85 million cars on the road, well, we think you'll understand how much an efficiency drive like this would help the situation. Exxon believes together we can help keep things moving. A Japan Airlines 747 jumbo jet is still being held by Arab terrorists in the tiny sheikdom of Dubai. Aboard the plane are 140 passengers and crew members, plus three or four Palestinian and Japanese terrorists. Another terrorist, a woman, was killed when a hand grenade she was carrying accidentally exploded. The hijackers don't appear to be interested in serious negotiations with police who have surrounded the plane. 
They say they have links to a band of Japanese terrorists called the Red Army, and they demand the release of one Japanese guerrilla who's in jail in Israel. Here's a report from Tokyo on the Red Army. Japan's pocket-sized Red Army, the Seiki Gun, made its international reputation in 1970 by hijacking a Japan Airlines jet to North Korea. Last year, Seiki Gun radicals armed with shotguns held at bay for five days a thousand Japanese police in a resort town killing two officers. The Seiki Gun has sent its members to help the Palestinian guerrillas. In May 1972, three Japanese terrorists carried out the Lod Airport massacre in Israel. One of the terrorists survived and was imprisoned. The hijackers of the jumbo jet demanded his release. The Seiki Gun members are vague anarchists who believe in violent worldwide revolution. Japanese police say that there are no more than 100 Seiki Gun members and that these have been quiet for a year and a half, at least in Japan. Jack Russell, NBC News, Tokyo. As usual, the terrorist demands are directed at Israel. And, as usual, Israel is taking a tough position saying that it will not give in to the terrorists. David Barrington reports. The Israelis decided several years ago not to give in to terrorist demands. Sometimes they pretend to negotiate, but so far that's been just to gain time. At first, when all this hijacking started about five years ago, they did give in. An Israeli airliner was hijacked to Algeria in 1968, and after long negotiations, the Israelis did release several dozen terrorists in return for the plane and its crew. But later, this was seen as a mistake. It only encouraged more hijacking attempts. So, in 1970, when 3707s were hijacked to Jordan, Israel turned down all terrorist demands, and the planes were blown up. This same hard line held during the Sabina hijacking last year, and nobody here expects it to change, regardless of the consequences. David Burrington, NBC News, at Tel Aviv Airport. And there's a report this evening that those Palestinian hijackers have demanded a ransom of $5 million and that Japan is ready to pay it. France today set off a nuclear bomb in the air. It happened at its nuclear testing ground in the Pacific and came despite protests from countries around the world. Karen Moss was born in Holland the year they started exploring for oil near her hometown. By the time she was in high school, they still hadn't found any. Then, in 1959, Exxon's Dutch affiliate and its partner hit it. Not oil, but gas. The biggest natural gas field and the largest single source of energy ever discovered in Europe. Karen probably couldn't care less about what she cooks with or heats her house with so long as it does it well. But she might be surprised to learn that her neighborhood Groningen gas field also runs a steel mill in Belgium, a brewery in Germany, heats sidewalk cafes in France, and pays a good share of Holland's taxes. It's been good for us, good for Karen's hometown, and good for Europe. Exxon, we'd like you to know. An official of the Cost of Living Council said today that Americans will begin paying more for food next week because the price freeze has been lifted. The official said price increases are likely to be most noticeable at first on pork, poultry, eggs, fresh fruits, and vegetables. One food that will not cost more next week is beef. There's still a ceiling on beef prices. That's making beef producers very unhappy and causing them to predict beef shortages. This should have been the best time of the year for the farmers who fatten cattle for market. They were recovering from disastrous winter weather and hoping for higher prices under phase four. But because of the continued ceiling on the price of beef, the farmers can't get those higher prices while their costs go on rising. Some feeders say they can't hold out until September 12th, the day President Nixon says he'll lift the ceiling. I've been a supporter of Nixon for many years. I thought he's done a good job, but he has certainly let us down on this deal here. And we're going to have a shortage. There's no ifs or ands about it. And I certainly can't see why we should be singled out as a single industry and the price squeeze lifted on everybody but the beef. The price squeeze has hit the beef packing industry hard, too. 
Hundreds of workers have been laid off in packing plants throughout Iowa. Plant owners are meeting this weekend to decide what to do. One major plant will put all its employees on a two-week vacation. Another, Flavorland of Sioux City, has suggested an industry-wide shutdown to show the people what a real shortage would be like. The state government has warned President Nixon that shortages and perhaps worse problems are coming. I think that definitely a uh, possibility of black market developing, which would cost the consumer uh, higher prices if they're going to have the supply, and at the same time, even deplete more rapidly the supply that is available in the next uh, two years. Cattlemen say the continuing price ceiling will have after effects for years, causing some farms and packing companies to fail and leaving the rest confused and worried about future price controls. And they say the ultimate loser is the beef consumer. Peter Nolan, NBC News. There already is a gasoline shortage, although it's not nearly as bad as it was a while ago. A former chairman of the Federal Power Commission now says one way to save gasoline would be for the federal government to force automakers to limit the size of their cars. That recommendation comes from Lee White, who served under Presidents Johnson and Kennedy.